Thank you. Uh, so the, I have a wonderful set of co-authors, uh, wonderful institutional collaborators who, in particular Vanguard, that has absolutely nothing to do with anything said here in terms of its official positions, etc. Uh, and the explicit subject is long-term care insurance. Uh, and the implicit subject is go out, gather your own, create your panel, gather your own data, ask some interesting questions, gather more data, and then maybe we'll be learning more as time passes. And ask them strange questions is the subtext. You'll see that. The uh, basic subject is obvious. Long-term care is extremely expensive. That's what the first part of that says. Not many people have bought long-term care insurance. That's what the second part of that says. Don't read the words beyond those two things. They're on the slide. It's kind of obvious. Long-term care is expensive. Not many people have the insurance. Why? We don't really know. There are certain motives that have to do with crowding out by things like public insurance. In other words, it could be a rational decision. Nobody wants this type of insurance. Uh, very strong bequest motives, which is why you're saving, and it's pretty linear. Who needs insurance? Alternatively, it might be that this is just a dreadful product out there that isn't the long-term care insurance that we model or that we imagine would be useful. And the third is that, uh, look, I mean, it's a reasonable product out there. People actually would like it. There's just a gap between cup and lip. They somehow aren't connecting to the products appropriately. And it's kind of behavioral of some form. Now, we need to answer the question. I'm going to be a completely formal standard economist. The way we will do this is we will model counterfactual demand for a product that doesn't exist. <laughs> that, of course, is kind of the question. What would happen in this world if there was perfect insurance? And by the way, in our economic modeling, we often model demand for perfect insurance. Since we can't go around and introduce this, we're going to use some new methods. Uh, we're going to study demand for this activities of daily living insurance. I will define that. It's kind of a cool variant on long-term care insurance. It says, if you're in a state physically in which you actually need help, we give you money. It's that simple. We're going to estimate demand using the uh, Vanguard Research Initiative, a sample I will introduce to you, a panel. Uh, we're going to estimate individual preferences using whacked out question type one, strategic survey questions. Uh, they are questions designed for the estimation of structural parameters in models. That was a mouthful. Then we're going to ask people as well. Uh, we're going to develop a model that's standard. We're going to find there is high demand for this product. In our model, there's just no question. The motivations seem to be lining up to, yes, long-term care is a big risk. Yes, I should be insuring it. There's just no way the model say anything different. I want to point out we're going to get there uh, with fancy methods to reach an extremely simple common sense conclusion. If the product was there, it was perfect. Our model says they'd buy it. Then we're going to imitate uh, uh, authors in this room, and we're going to go for stated demand. We're going to actually describe this product, the ideal, to the people in the panel and ask them, do you want it? Let's see how much they want. It turns out we do find that there is interest in this product beyond actual holdings, but it's significantly lower than what our model said. And we're going to look at the gap and draw a few conclusions from that gap. OK, uh, activities of daily living insurance. If you need long-term care, if you need help with the activities of daily living, I'm going to skip through much of the background this slide says it's very expensive, and you have a lot of choice in how much you spend on long-term care. If you want nurse, if you want um, home health aid, fifty thousand bucks in New York. Uh, if you want nursing home, private room, two hundred to fifty thousand. You have a choice. Because of that, our model has only three key features, and um, we, we are borrowing liberally from uh, Maria Christina's work. We're going to take healthy or sick. You're going to have a standard utility function. Long-term care, 
or bequest, you're going to have a Donati utility function, which says, basically, you can want something with a high intensity, theta, and you can want something to, as a luxury or as a necessity, kappa. That's all that is intended to say, and I'm sorry for showing it to you. It's ugly. Um, who are we working with? 9,000 Vanguard clients in the Vanguard Research Initiative. Uh, 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 this is a very appropriate sample for those who might be interested in this product. You know, we've written a paper called The Wealth of Wealth Holders because they have wealth. Uh, and therefore, they have wealth that they could, in principle, buy uh, insurance with. Uh, we've tended to oversample signal, uh, singles. They're not representative sample of the, of the US, more educated, et cetera. We've conducted three surveys, wealth, income, and expectations, annuities, long-term care, public care requests, family structure, inter vivos transfers, and so on. All I'll tell you is there's both tremendous pleasure and tremendous pain involved in the process of survey design. The pleasure is that you're really inside the machine, and you're really thinking about the question and what does it actually mean. And it turns out the pain is that you become aware of all the ambiguities in every piece of data you've ever seen. Like, what did that mean? Uh, anyway, you'll see we have plenty of hours. Our key questions. OK, why are we doing anything funky? Why aren't we just going out measuring behavior? Well, the fundamental reason is that it's very hard in the choice data to separate I'm saving for the very last thing I will ever do, which is go into a long-term care facility, or I'm saving for the very first thing that will happen upon my exit from that facility in the wrong position, which is the bequest. So it's really essentially impossible to, do, to tell those apart in, given that wealth is fungible and people aren't buying many, insurance of many forms. So what we're going to do is we're going to try and get inside somebody's head and uh, describe a hypothetical environment, the state, hypothetical future, choice set, verify their understanding, record a choice. We had a tremendous process for designing these questions. It we went through psychologists, went through um, interviews with a, a panel. Uh, we had a trial panel that we worked with. We, we wanted to make sure that they vaguely understood what we were asking. Four types of questions, risk aversion, Long-term care state, bequest state, public care aversion. I'm going to take you through one. Here's the design process. This is the key thing to take away. You want to know, you want to know something that's hidden in behavioral data. You have to ask a question about something that hasn't happened. It has to be a hypothetical situation which, should it happen, would have been very informative. So now we're going to dig inside a situation which, should it have happened, it would have been very informative. OK. We're going to translate the following thing into words. That is the challenge. We know exactly what we'd like to ask them. Please solve for x1 in the following equation to ref perfectly reflect your preferences. It's a trade-off in which x1 tells you how much they care about activities of daily living versus how much they care about requests. We didn't think that they would answer this question well. So we asked them the following thing. By the way, they had a health warning that they would not enjoy the questioning. And if they were squeamish, they should not. And here's how it begins. Suppose you are 85 years old, live alone, rent your home, pay all your own bills. By the way, most of these are single syllable words on, with the help of Wendy Brun de Brun. We had originally set it. It was very highfalutin. Uh, it isn't now. You know with certainty that you will live for only 12 more months and that you will need help with activities of daily living for the entire 12 months. You have $100,000 that you need to split, split into Arrow Securities. I mean, whoops, Plan E and Plan F. Uh, plan E is reserved for your spending. From Plan E, you will need to pay all of your expenses, including long-term care, any other ones, needs, and discretionary purchases. Plan F is an irrevocable bequest. If it so happened they had to make this choice infungibly, they would tell us a lot about their priorities. So we asked them to make it, mentally. OK, then we had to spell out the rules for the scenario. No money other than 100,000, other than this plan E. You have no other resources, et cetera, et cetera. I can tell you, as a page, we go over a whole set of rules that detail the scenario enough for them, if they understood it, to be inside our model to some extent. We then 
invented a slider. This was rather hard work. A slider in which they could see, as they moved left and right, with nothing initially placed there, they could see the entire change in allocation and how it would affect the amount of money they had in the two states. So the, and we made it so there was nothing initially on the slider. So they had to place initially, and we said, please move it around, and then they'd sign off, I'm done. We did that for a whole bunch of different questions, and we did it varying the amount of money. And just to give you one little proof of coherence, this is much like with Mansky on measuring expectations. The first thing you do is press check whether questions that have reasonable answers. In the case of expectations questions, you check if probabilities add to one. Things like that. In, in our case, we, just, we checked against a number of external measures, but here's the one that's going to tell you the whole story of what we found. If you have $100,000 between the bequest and long-term care, many people put $100,000 into long-term care. If you have 150,000, they spread right out of 100 into 150. <laughs> if they have 200,000, eh, now, now they're starting to divide up the money. But they're certainly giving a very high priority to long-term care. Here's the whole set of questions, four strategic survey questions. Now what we're going to do is we're going to go to the individual level. We're going to assume an additive response error and derive the likelihood function. And what we're doing now is estimating preference parameters for every single panel member. We've done this before in a different piece of work. We did it at the representative agent level. Now I'm gonna, we're going to go and we're going to estimate every individual's preference parameters. We're then going to take those preference parameters through their demand very standard way, how much of activities of daily living insurance should they buy? Now, what is activities of daily living insurance? It's an arrow security that pays out in the state when you need help with activities of daily living. There's really no other economic way of defining what long-term care need is. It's something contingent on a health state that you've hit. In that health state, you have some other needs. Those other needs call for expenses. We're going to deliver you money in the state in which you need expenses, and we're not going to tell you what to do with it. We're not going to tell you get a, get a home health aid or move to a facility. You could pay your family if you wish to. You could do anything you wish. Just insurance for that state. Um, no default risk, risk in, in, and inflation protected. When we do the estimation, it is no surprise to find that 66% of our sample would ask for this product. It seems so ideal given their statement of risk, even though there's high heterogeneity and not everybody wants it. 66% say yes. We have a single question, yes, no, about the panel, do they hold private long-term care insurance? 22% hold any. So 66% we think should want it, 22% actually own it, and there's totally evident reasons in their preference parameters for the distinction. Risk aversion levels, how much they hate public care, all the parameters in the model that should matter, they matter. And I just want to point out that this is a very robust statement. That is, you can break out our wealth quintiles, and you can break out our income quintiles, and you can find that while it is true that the ideal proportion who should own this product diminishes. The holdings diminish too, and the gap is there. It's pretty robust. This vision of preferences, which is now the current standard vision of preferences, suggests high demand for long-term care insurance. That's, of course it does. I mean, you can see immediately from the first level answers. Then, the, um, I can just tell you that we've re-estimated this, trying to re-weight our sample to look like the HRS. There's no, you can't drive a stake through this fact. It seems to be the case that people it, with any type of preferences that we can understand, with any type of, even if you add that it's not actuarially fair, this product looks like a fantastic winner. 
now. We decided, OK, we were worried that maybe the model is just a model. In fact, we kind of know it's just a model. So let's ask you, no, really, because we didn't ask them. Now we're, now we're going to go ask them. In the same survey, since we spent all this time introducing all this apparatus to make them understand our question, <coughs> We introduced this product called Activities of Daily Living Insurance that's perfect insurance. It's a one-time non-refundable lump sum. If you need help, you'll immediately receive a monthly cash benefit, index for inflation. You can do anything you want with it. It's perfect. It, you know, it's going to be checked up. An impartial third party will find out that you need help. There's nothing wrong with this product. It's the perfect one. We've input their details and output an actuarially fair price for it. And now we find that, in fact, there is demand for this product to some extent. And if you look at the brown bar there, that's the stated people who would buy it. If you look to the gray bar, that grandfathers in those who already own long-term care insurance of their own separately. So it looks like we've gone from roughly the, the model prediction of 66, the actual holdings of 22, and an optimistic take on this is that half the puzzle, it kind of, it's fine, we've got it. It's all to do with the, this is how much they would buy of the ideal product. So we see something about where the gap is. I would point out that calling us 50% of the way there is a little bit optimistic. Uh, it turns out the quantitative demands that we get from people when we ask them, how much would you like? are significantly below what the model says also. So the model says this is a very, very good product. And now I want to just give you the kind of uh, last thing we do, which is to say um, there's a gap here. We did all this work to get numbers out. We got numbers out two way. We got numbers out from a model, how much would you buy? We got numbers out from your statement, how much would you buy? By making them numerical, we have a difference. With a difference, we can think what accounts for the difference. And I can tell you that one thing that accounts for that seems to uh, help understand the difference is if people made transfers to their children. Now, that's an interesting thing, because it says that maybe we're mismodeling the bequest motive. And indeed, I believe we are. And we're going to have to think a little bit more about the difference between making a transfer during the life and making a transfer at, at the end of life. So we're learning something about what might be wrong with our thinking there's some additional factors going into saving that aren't in our model. Comprehension. Uh, we actually tested understanding of the survey. And those who understood the survey better gave, a closer, uh, gave answers that were closer to the model. Then uh, evidence of adverse selection. Those who believe that they're going to need additional help with ADLs over and above what is uh, what our model said, because we're using actuarial tables, uh, it, w it went the right way. I can't even think of signs right now. Uh, Long-term care is a very large risk. We find high demand for ill products. We get hints as to next steps. But this is really the bottom line. In a field dominated by counterfactuals, we need an improved measurement. That's the key to our understanding. We're going to have to get new data to do that. Quantitative surveys have particularly high potential. And the data and the theory should be developed symbiotically.